Thank you, Judge Steele. The, the win seat is the next seat that's up. Three minutes. Uh, your letter may have said five minutes, but it is three minutes, and so we're going to move. I'm sorry about that. The public's perception is that indigent defendants facing capital murder charges have unlimited access to some of the best legal talent in North Carolina, and that the taxpayers in the state are required to fund high levels of costs for experts and forensic analysis. In the economic environment in which we find ourselves, and where in the last several years terms of court have been canceled due to lack of resources or inadequate pay for court reporters, how does the judicial system balance protection for those few with the proper administration of justice for the many? Uh, the first candidate is Wesley Castine. I think I was the last to arrive and the first to speak, so at least among our group. And Lynette was nice enough as I walked in the door to inform me that my five minutes of prepared remarks had to be cut down to three. So that's what I've been doing for the last couple of minutes. So I'll try to get you back to lunch as quickly as possible. But I am Wesley Castine, and I am running for the Court of Appeals, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you here today. Being both an attorney and CPA, I feel that my breadth of experience makes me singularly qualified to bring a new perspective to matters that come before the court. It was this difference that originally motivated me to seek office with the Court of Appeals. My law practice has placed me before all divisions of the North Carolina courts, including the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. In addition, I've also represented clients before the United States Bankruptcy Court and the United States Tax Court. While a zealous advocate for my clients, I have endeavored to remain faithful not only to the laws of the state of North Carolina, but also to the guiding principles upon which those laws are founded. The question posed specifically references a criminal defendant. Regardless of whether the initial question related to a criminal defendant or a civil litigant, the question can be similarly answered. The question also references the public's perception of a defendant's right to counsel. The first step is not to cloud reason and reality with the public's perception of the practice of law. We can never provide a perfect forum in which all deserving parties are satisfied with the outcome. Instead, the goal should be to provide and adequately maintain a fair and impartial forum to which all parties have reasonable access. Our courts, particularly at the appellate levels, rarely, if ever, have the luxury of deciding a case on a single issue or considering the impact of that case on a single deserving party. More often, the role of the courts is to balance the rights, interests, privileges, and responsibilities of many parties where these interests are mutually exclusive, as they often are, someone is going to lose. Having the experience and willingness to fairly and reasonably apply those balancing tests are the signs of good jurists. It's not the outcome that's most important. It is true that the outcome is important to the individual being ruled upon. But the confidence in the judiciary is paramount. Several years ago, I had a client that lost a case that was very important to him that he'd worked years on, and we'd work up and down the appellate levels. But when he eventually lost, the client was satisfied and content, believing that our system of justice had given him his day in court. That day in court is often the best result that we can achieve for our clients in the legal system. I thank you for this opportunity, and I hope to have your vote and support on November 2nd. For more information, please refer to my website, castteam.org. Thank you very much. Thank you. Christopher Dillon. I'm Chris Dillon, and I appreciate y'all having me, having all of us here today, and I'll be very brief. Uh, my wife asked me a few weeks ago, as I've been getting letters to appear at a lot of different things, which, things I, which, which events I was going to go to, and I told her this is one I wanted to go to, and she said, well, how long are you going to be able to speak for? And I said, probably three to five minutes. And she said, do you, do you really want to go up there? Then I looked on the school calendar. We have five children, and I realized today was a teacher work day, and the kids would be home. So I told her, yes, I'm going to go to Greensboro today. So. <laughs> I appreciate y'all having us. Um, 
I practice, let me tell you a little bit about myself and, and why I'm doing this. I, I did practice law for 10 years in Raleigh, uh, most of which was with Young Moore in Raleigh, um, a, a fine defense firm there, and have a lot of friends there. But since then, I've um, run a business, and for the past four years, I um, have been working at a community bank in Raleigh that I helped start. It's called Capstone Bank. And primarily what, what we do is we, we work with the business community, with the real estate community, and, um, and, it's, and it's been a great experience for me. And, and I just I believe that the court needs that perspective on, right now. I, I believe that, that, that sometimes that, that can be lacking, that, that you need somebody with a broad, broad range of experience on the court. And I think uh, the court system in general, to, to address the question, um, and I think it was an excellent question. A lot of my friends who aren't attorneys complain how they don't know anybody on the, on the ballot, and, and that's a shame because the judicial branch is a branch of government. It's one of the three branches of government. It's, very, it's, it's just as important as the executive branch and the legislative branch, and I think that just gets lost in the public. And, and that question is a great question, the perception that too much money, they think too much money is thrown one way or the other, but it's very important that we have a judicial system that everybody can have confidence in. And the only way we can have that, I think, is if there's enough resources that we can that we can we can put into it so that everybody gets a fair 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 trial or a fair chance in the court system. But I know that where the economy is in my family, we have to make choices. I mean, it would be nice to be able to do this to buy that car or to buy this or buy that, but you've got to make choices. And I believe that's that's what we've got to do in our case. And they're very difficult choices to make. But I think um, I think what we need to do though is, is to try to figure out a way to get more resources because we need that. We need to have, to be able to have a judicial system where everybody has an opportunity to have a, a fair shake, whether it's a capital defendant or, or, or everybody else because we don't need the court system to be shut down because it's a very important branch of government. We need to have that. So I appreciate your time and I've, I've cut it short and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Garner. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today and to address you. Uh, my wife of 35 years is here with me today. We are the proud parents of 11 children and 12 grandchildren. So if we've learned anything over 35 years, it's flexibility. So five minutes is just going to be cut to three minutes. In answering the question that was put to for, before us, there are three things that came to my mind. The first is, uh, and this is having to do with the expenses allocated to indigent, indigent defense. The first thing has to do with a broad philosophical point. Every one of us, most of us are lawyers here, but every one of us in North Carolina, we, whether we are lawyers or non-lawyers, have a strong interest in the system of justice. Judge Steelman referred to that. We have a vital interest in that. And it's, it, it's useful for us as attorneys to imagine ourselves from time to time in the dock. What kind of resources would we want available to us? What kind of system would we want that system to be? Okay. So point number one is we all have an interest in the cause of justice. It's not just concern about the indigent funding, but we all want to see that our system of justice leads to proper results, that crimes are properly investigated, properly prosecuted, and so on. We cannot forget that. Second is, as I talk to people uh, in this campaign and also just generally, very, very, very few people in North Carolina realize that far less than 5% of our state budget every year goes to the third co-equal branch of government, the judicial department. The public just doesn't know that. And when they find out that something on the order of $400 million out of a budget of 20 billion, that's B as in bananas for billion, goes to the judicial department. They're shocked that it works as well as it does. And that's to the great credit of our bench and bar. The third thing is allocation choices are made by the uh, uh, administrative office of the courts, ultimately under the supervision of our Chief Justice. And I think they're doing the best they can, as all North Carolinians are, under these difficult economic circumstances. My website is garnerforjudge.com. 
I'd love to hear from you. Send me an email at garnerforjudge at gmail.com. I've got 28 years of experience. I was in private practice in Durham for nine years, then with the Employment Security Commission for seven years, heard 6,000 plus cases. For the last 11 years, I've been counsel to the Commissioner of Banks in Raleigh, working on legislation, on litigation, and interpreting and applying sometimes complex law on a daily basis. I hope you'll avail yourself of the resources that are out there for you to research the candidates in this strange baker's dozen uh, instant runoff uh, race. And I hope you'll make me, if you can't make me your first choice, I hope I'll rate number two on your ballot in November. Thank you very much. Stanley Hammer. Thank you, David, and I want to thank the defense attorneys for having me here today and for holding this forum. It's very important. I will mention to you that uh, my website is hammerforjudge.com, and what I really want to do is the same thing I hope that I'll do if I'm on the bench, and that's answer the question and get right to it. Um, the question is that you have posed is an issue that is not going to come before the Court of Appeals. So I think it is important that you know how I would answer a tough question because I am seeking your endorsement, and I hope you will consider that. The question begins by stating that the public perceives that too much money is being spent essentially on expert witnesses and for forensics. Um, that may be the public perception, I'm not certain of that, but assuming that it is, it's our duty as lawyers, I believe, to educate the public whenever possible that we have constitutional rights in this system, and the constitutional rights are important, and they can't, they can't be sacrificed on the whim of public, policy, uh, public opinion, or sometimes because of the cost involved. I want to tell you that I practice primarily on the civil side, and I've had the pleasure of working with many of you in this room, either as co-counsel or in some instances uh, having been on the other side uh, of the aisle. But I've also represented capital defendants. I represented capital defendants as a public defender, and I represented capital defendants in my private practice, even though, again, it's primarily civil. And I have been in the position of applying for fees and expert witness fees. And one of the problems that we have in this whole system, frankly, is that frequently someone will be charged at, with a capital first degree uh, murder as, as a capital case, first degree murder as a capital case. As an attorney, you're obligated to apply for fees, to hire psychiatrists, to hire forensics uh, experts. And then you find that, well, maybe the district attorney is going to offer second degree. Or just as frequently, the case will be tried and the jury imposes a life sentence. The hidden costs that the public doesn't see are all these cases that are tried capitally and cost a lot of money, but they end up with the same sentence as non-capital first degree murder cases. So if we're talking in terms of counseling, civil terms of court, laying off court reporters, failing to provide adequate resources for the civil justice system, I think that what we're going to have to do in this state is recognize, we must recognize, we must be honest about it, there's not a public right to the death penalty. Where it's time for us to have a serious adult conversation about the administration of the death penalty. Does that mean abolishing the death penalty? Maybe not. Does that mean changing the law so that the death penalty is applied in even fewer cases and sought in fewer cases? Maybe so. That's not a question that's going to be decided by the courts. It's going to be question, a question that's going to be decided by the legislature. And I urge you as defense attorneys to talk with your friends and colleagues who are district attorneys about this problem. If you feel that the justice system is overwhelmed because of these cases, that's something you need to talk to them about. Let me tell you very briefly about myself. Um, 
which you can actually look at on the website. I've practiced for over 25 years, and I've had 40 cases in the Court of Appeals. Thank you very much.